Calaroga Shark Media. Hello, I'm Johnny Mack with your daily comedy news. I got some fights for you, and I enjoy that. From Indy Star, Cat Williams sold out show at the Indiana Farmers Coliseum on Saturday night ended early. James uh, told Indy Star the story. Apparently, before Cat Williams took the stage, a man sitting in the row in front of James was invading his personal space because the seats were so close. The back of the man's head in the row in front of James would be close to James's lap whenever he leaned back. James said, I tapped him. I'm like, hey, man, I'm not trying to stop your good time, but can you please stop putting your head in my lap? James says the man responded with a dismissive gesture. So he walked to concessions to keep calm. The guy's friend, though, apparently encouraged the man with the uh, head in the lap to fight James. James told the Indy Star, he said, you should really knock him out. James said, I couldn't pay attention to Cat Williams' performance because of everything had kept going on. I wasn't sitting there arguing with him. The guy kept trying to irritate me. Mrs. James urged her husband to keep cool, and they decided to leave the show. They figured they could watch the last part of Cat's set from the TV out in the hallways. On his way out, though, James looked back and saw one of the men, not the guy with the lap, the guy who encouraged the lap person to attack James. He saw that person attempt to hit his wife. James doubled back and then full on fight. Mrs. James got between her husband and the man, fearing they were too close to the balcony railing and calling for them to stop fighting. Mrs. James says the man who by then had a bloody nose intentionally wiped the blood on her face. Now, apparently, again, I wasn't there. People had complained about the group in the more forward row before James even got hassled. As the story goes, security told the men to stop bothering other attendees. The men countered they weren't being rude and they were the ones being insulted. Mrs. James said, I don't know why security didn't dismiss them the first time. She said she broke the heel of her shoe and bruised her thigh during the incident. There's a video on social media. Cat Williams wraps it up and says, thank you all for coming. God bless you. Have a good night. TMZ reported that reps for Cat Williams said the show was cut only five minutes early. Meanwhile, a headline from TMZ, Gerard Carmichael slammed for joke about slavery, race play with white boyfriend. Now, is it me? I have no interest in Gerard Carmichael reality show at all. Have you watched it? Is it good? I just, I'm not interested in it. TMZ reports the controversial quip came on Gerard Carmichael reality show where Gerard says, I sometimes joke to him that our relationship is like that of a slave and a master's son who like teaches me how to read by candlelight. Yeah, he groans too because he's a good person. He doesn't like that joke. I like that joke. That's my burden. I think that's hilarious. The scene apparently got posted all over Instagram and ignited a firestorm of criticism. Folks are blasting Gerard's joke as an inappropriate take on racial inequality. Netflix announced a six-episode John Mulaney thingy called John Mulaney Presents Everybody's in L.A. This will debut May 3rd with additional episodes debuting nightly beginning at 7 Pacific. Ah, that's not good for us East Coasters. What are you doing, Netflix? The other episodes will run May 6th. I don't know why the gap in between. Mulaney will be performing at the Hollywood Bowl on May 4th. All right, so what happens in John Mulaney Presents Everybody's in L.A.? Each of the live installments will feature Mulaney exploring the city and will incorporate many of the famous and not-so-famous faces in town. Netflix describes it as the comically unconventional show featuring special guests and field pieces shot in L.A. No news yet on who will be on the show. By the way, John Mulaney in a trailer looks pretty good with his hair grown out. Speaking of L.A., Nick Kroll spoke to LAist and was discussing Netflix, so these two stories pair nicely. Kroll said of Netflix, I think it can take a comedian who would have in the past been able to perform at clubs around the country just as a working comedian and really expand their audience. Like somebody like Ali Wong, who before her special was an amazing comedian and was a working comedian, the exposure Netflix gave her has made her a household name, and she's obviously gone on to do other kinds of stuff, like beef. Kroll discussed the economics of comedy in the internet age. He said it's opened up tremendously from where it was. Montreal was a comedy festival, and there was another one in Aspen when I was starting out. If you were at my stage or at the beginning of your career, you really needed to go one of those festivals and get noticed and get signed by agents, managers, hopefully some sort of deal to develop a sitcom or maybe once in a blue moon get an HBO special. That has changed dramatically. Aspen is no more. I was at Aspen. I saw George Carlin there. Montreal's in real financial trouble. I think it's because the internet has just opened that up so much. If you're a funny person, you start to make funny videos on TikTok, or you have a podcast that builds an audience, or you're on Patreon, or you have a dedicated group of people, you can build audiences in so many ways and build revenue streams for yourself in so many ways. That has changed the economics of it. All right, I had promised you some Bob's Muda stories. 
And this is a good time for me to tell them. I, I'm stumbling over the reeds today. I went up on Monday for the eclipse and I got home at 12.45 a.m. It took me longer to drive back from Vermont than it did to get back from Michigan a couple weeks back. And if everything went according to plan, in your podcast feed, the Travel is Back podcast should have an episode titled something along the lines of Burlington, Vermont, Eclipse Something. So if you want to hear my eclipse journeys, you can switch over to the Travel is Back podcast when we're done here. All right, Bob's Muda. Are you hip to Tony Clifton? So Tony Clifton is a big, loud, belligerent comedian who thinks he's the greatest comedian in the world. There are those who believe that Tony Clifton was Andy Kaufman's alter ego. There are those who believe that since Andy passed away, Bob Zmuda has played the role. Now, I got to spend time with Bob Zmuda, oh, it's probably 15 years ago now, and he would never quite admit to being Tony Clifton. And he was up a couple days in a row. We were working on an idea. So at SiriusXM, I don't know if they still do it, but we used to do these town halls. So you would get a famous person to come in. You'd invite 12 to 20 fans up to hang out in our fishbowl studio. And it was kind of an intimate event. You'd try and get famous people to do it. One I remember we did with Henry Winkler and Bruno Mars walked down the hallway and saw Henry Winkler and came in. And like so that was like a really cool moment. We had Cheech and Chong one time, and I think Snoop was there, if I remember correctly, and he popped in. Like, so that kind of like cool celebrity thing. We were working on an idea. We wanted to do Andy Kaufman Town Hall, and the, and the Kaufman estate was cool with it. They were going to give me a quote where Andy was going to say he was really excited to be part of this thing, and we were going to do a total Kaufman-type put-on of... You know, hey, welcome to the broadcast. Apparently, Andy's running a little late, and we were going to kill time. We were going to ask Kristen Schaal to be part of it because she had won the inaugural, I think it was, Kaufman Award. We were going to ask Muda to be part of it as Tony Clifton. Not that he is Tony Clifton, but we were going to ask him, which is ridiculous because he's not Tony Clifton. And we were just going to drag this thing out and just keep killing time and have Andy Kaufman never actually show up. So Zamuda told me a story one time that they were doing something similar, and they booked a venue and they were just killing time and killing time. I don't remember the story exactly, but he said it eventually was like three or four in the morning and people just would not leave. So he tried to ad lib a plan. He said, okay, that was part one of the show. Now part two of the show is on the Staten Island Ferry. So meet us there at 530. So he headed downtown and figured people would give in. Oh no, Kaufman devotees showed up at the Staten Island Ferry. They took the ferry over to Staten Island, got breakfast and Zmuda said he eventually had to fall on his sword and be like, all right, you got me. Andy is not coming. Um, so that was a good put on. And the other thing that I remember is we booked Tony Clifton to be up at Sirius and Tony Clifton shows up and this was, you know, everything in New York City post 9-11. The security got ridiculous. It was a pain in the neck to get into that building. Any day I forgot my ID, it would like I'd have to call upstairs and get someone to verify myself. It's easier to get through the airport than to get into that building. So Tony Clifton shows up. And he does not have any ID that says he's Tony Clifton, so they won't let him in. And he threw a big tantrum down in the lobby and left. <laughs> so if Tony Clifton were Bob's Muda, which he's totally not, he didn't break character. He stayed in character as Tony Clifton and never made it upstairs. I've got some more stories, maybe tomorrow, maybe on the weekend. I'm really excited. The podcast Five Good News Stories, number five good news stories, which I also host, has made the Apple Top 100, no subcategory, the main Top 100. I'm telling you, as a professional podcaster, to achieve that from the basement is not easy. And now Apple Podcast promoted the show, which is why it zoomed up the charts. But boy, that one is off to the races. Five good news stories, wherever you get your programs. Told you about the eclipse. Travel is back. I understand Curb Your Enthusiasm was good. Um, so what happened here, I didn't watch it because, one, I wanted to get up early and drive to Vermont on Monday. Uh, two, Saturday night I was watching shows and it was around 10 o'clock and I'm like, I don't know. What do I want to watch? Let me see what Peacock has. And Peacock had WrestleMania. And I'm like, all right, I haven't watched wrestling forever. And they're like, coming up next, The Rock. And I'm like, OK, so I watched WrestleMania on Saturday night. And many of you are going to be like, yeah, we know Johnny Mac, where you've been. But I was blown away by the production values and the high entertainment of it all. Just the intros alone. I was like, all right, I'll watch this. And I watched the rock fight till, I don't know, 1115 or so. And then I went to bed. So then Sunday night when it was WrestleMania night two, I was like, you know what? 
I'm going to stare at that again. And and again, the production values, uh, they had a band come out that looked like a combination of Carnival and Mardi Gras. It was just so much fun. Uh, So I didn't finish WrestleMania because I went to bed and I didn't watch Curb. And uh, my plan for Tuesday night was to watch Neil Brennan and maybe finish uh, WrestleMania. We'll see. Anyway, I understand Curb was good. When I get around to it, I will tell you about it. I listened to... Oh, 13 hours of podcasts on Monday, and I have a problem. This is not a made-up number. I'll send you the screenshot if you don't believe me. So after driving, it took about five, six hours to get up there. Coming back took almost nine with all the traffic. I listened to 13 hours of podcasts Monday at 2.2, 2.3 speed, and I still, listen to this number, I still have 252 podcasts downloaded to my phone. (laughs) I have a problem. Uh, One of the podcasts I listened to was Tim Dillon. He was a guest on Diary of a CEO. So if you want to hear the real Tim Dillon, that's the one I told you the other day that um, people had pulled out some sizzle quotes of Tim bashing the millennials, etc. If you hear it in context, he's clearly doing a riff. Uh, But if you want to hear a real interview with Tim Dillon and why I like Tim Dillon a lot, listen to the Diary of CEO podcast where Tim is the guest. And again, eventually Tim's going to step on a landmine and I will distance myself from him. We've had a little controversy in the Facebook group, which is Daily Comedy News Podcast Group. Feel encouraged to join us there. There are some people who are sick and tired of the Joe Coy joke. Now, I don't know if you know this, back at the Golden Globes, no, I won't do it. Um, People are sick of the Golden Globes joke. Others seem to be on Team Johnny Mac, who think the repetition is funny. My point of view is something starts out funny, then gets really annoying, but if you stick with it, it comes back around to be even funnier because of the repetition. So some people are on Team Johnny Mac with that. But I'll give it a rest. But I said rest. It's not going away forever. How about that? That's a nice compromise. The Moon Tower Comedy Festival kicks off today. That means I got to add another bookmark here on my MacBook schedule. Let's see. 7 o'clock, Frankie Quinones. 7 o'clock, Jeff Ross. 9.30, Desi Banks. 9.30, Rachel Bloom. Let's see. Do I want to... I was going to say let's go see Jeff Ross, but I feel like we know what Jeff does. Let's go see Frankie Quinones to mix it up. And then whatever you want to do at 9.30, Desi or Rachel, up to you. Meanwhile, Melbourne Comedy Festival, where it's already April 11th in Australia. John, did you preload the website today? No. Let's do some without clips today. Billy Styles' show is called The Trip. It's the hilarious story of Billy winning an all-expenses-paid trip to Hawaii on the main radio station in Australia by making up a story of how his marriage was broken up by an affair and the drama and karma that was to follow. Billy was not married at the time. All right, that's fun. Cameron James' show is called Mixtape, and there's a little icon here that says Selling Fast. Let's see why. Well, he was the winner of the Director's Choice Award at the 2022 Sydney Comedy Festival and a nominee for the 2022 Melbourne International Comedy Festival Award for Most Outstanding Show. The Age said Comedy Par Excellence. Four and a half stars out of presumably five. Time Out said, We howled four stars out of who knows how many stars, presumably four, perhaps a million. The description, hi, my name's Cameron James, and this is a show about music, love, and the summer in 2009 that I worked as a singing Captain Jack Sparrow impersonator at a suburban dinner theater restaurant. Chuck in the tape, press play, and crank the volume on a high-energy love letter to the songs that shaped your life and the memories they spark, the first kisses, the first breakups, the first jobs, all of it. After an award-winning sellout 2023 tour, Cam returns to Melbourne with a carefully curated mixtape of hilariously true stories and ridiculous original songs. All for his embarrassment and your amusement. That sounds fun. Chan Lock Tim, a Cantonese comedy show, and there's some Cantonese characters here. Oh, there is a clip. Let's listen. All right, I'm going to fall on my sword here. What I wanted to do there was get to a laugh and then tell you I thought he was pretty funny. You guys didn't realize I speak Cantonese. I played the clip for a minute. The crowd never laughed. So I cut it short. The other thing I was going to do is say that he made a joke about Taylor Swift. (laughs) See you tomorrow.